All right, so this is going to be a lecture about the uh, definitions for this class. Uh, I'm going to put, the, put this on the other screen. You can follow along with your own sheet. Um, but I'm just going to go through these so we can see what they are. Uh, and I'm going to kind of bunch these together, too. So some of these will be uh, reliant on each other or help each other understand it. Uh, so the first uh, item is resolution. In order to understand resolution, we have to understand what a pixel is. And a pixel is just a dot that makes up an image. And I'm sure we've um, seen those before if we... We're going to zoom in on an image. Each one of these little squares here is a pixel, okay? So a resolution refers to um, how many pixels we have going uh, across and how many pixels we have going up and down. Um, some common ones are uh, HD 720 or 720p, which is 1280 by 720. And then there's uh, uh, 1080p, which is 1920 by 1080. And then there's Ultra 4D, uh, HD, which is 4K. 2160 by 3840. Um, now, <clears throat> the um, the difference in the width to the height can be expressed as a um, two different numbers. Um, you can refer to it in a uh, semicolon fashion. So, like here, where we talk about the aspect ratio, you can refer to it as like a four to three. So that's what the old TVs were, or like a sixteen to nine, which means that for every nine pixels in one direction, there's sixteen in the other. Okay, or you can refer to it in this fashion, 2.35 to 1. Uh, so you might see different aspect ratios. Typically for um, uh, the stuff that we work on, as long as we understand the basic you know, format that we're working with and, and understand the aspect ratio, then we're, we're pretty good. Uh, and then there's another one called the pixel aspect ratio. And I don't get, out, get that one confused, uh, but the pixel aspect ratio is basically when pixels are stretched. And sometimes they can be stretched and not square. They could be rectangle. Uh, and again, that's something important to know so that um, as we're building stuff, we would do it. Most of our stuff, we don't need to worry about that too much, okay? Uh, inside of an image, inside of something we're rendering out, uh, we typically have a couple different areas here. <clears throat> we have a, uh, an action safe, which is what this outside box is. And then we have a title safe, which is what this second inner box is. And these two things basically allow us to make sure that if we did have a title, it wouldn't be like falling off the screen. If for some reason our display kind of cut off part of the image, um, that would make sure that it doesn't cut it off, you know, the title, because that's an important thing to have. And the same thing with the action, you know, that can go a little bit further, uh, but that would be the action safe area for it. So typically we keep our stuff kind of centered in the screen uh, or in one of the thirds, and we're good with that. Uh, the next area is channels. So uh, I'm going to jump over to Nuke. So channels play a huge role in Nuke because it's not only um, looking at them, but also interacting with them. Um, inside here, we're currently looking at the red, green, and blue channel. Uh, we're not looking at the alpha channel, but it is in play. Um, as I move my mouse over, you can see all the red, green, blue. Um, if I hit R, G, and B, uh, again, you can kind of see what those do, or I hit A for alpha. And then, obviously, inside of the um, area here, we can see all the other channels that Nuke um, allows us to have. Um, that alpha channel is used for transparency. So as we bring items together, uh, that's what it's going to be used for. So if we wanted to add um, a background to this. <clears throat> and I'm just going to merge. There's my A, there's my B. Now I have this on an actual background. Without that alpha channel, we wouldn't have that. It would actually be some like weird... Uh, blend right here. So if I just made this all black, then we lose it. Okay. So we definitely need an alpha channel when we're dealing with things like transparency uh, for that reason. Uh, when you get an image, typically you'll see that it's <coughs> going to be an RGB, typically when that's the kind we deal with. Uh, but then the RGBA just means that it stores that alpha information too. And again, that's something that as we work, um, we should be dealing with RGBA for most of our stuff. But some things, like if I grabbed a JPEG from Photoshop, that's not going to have an alpha channel, okay? Uh, the next area has to deal with compression, uh, okay? So this one here, um, whenever we have an image or a video or a piece of sound or anything, um, it goes through a format where it compresses it <clears throat> and then it restores it. So this is the compression part where it's removing redundant data to make it smaller file size. Uh, and then when it restores it, it makes it back to that bigger size. Okay, so it can't really work with it at this point, uh, but it makes it, you know, back to this, then we can work on it. This is called lossless when we don't lose any of that data. Uh, lossy is when we do lose data. So if we had a JPEG and we saved it, it 
strips out some of the data. And so that when it restores it, we actually have like a smaller file um, altogether. And that'd be true for if we did this again, it would shrink it down again, and then we would lose more data um, as we go. <clears throat> this part of these arrows here where it compresses it and decompresses it, that's where the codec comes in. Because the codec is what codes it and then decompresses it. Um, there's a couple different kinds of things that we need to worry about. Uh, one of them is QuickTime. So QuickTime is just a video format. Typically, we're going to use um, H.264 or QuickTime. They're kind of used interchangeably at the moment. Um, and then TIFF. <clears throat> Another one is EXR, but TIFF is typically, if we're going from Photoshop and bringing stuff into uh, Nuke or After Effects, we would typically save it as a TIFF. If we rendered something out of 3D, uh, that's where we're going to use an EXR because EXRs will store all of those channels there. Okay. Uh, let's jump over there. <clears throat> uh, ambient light. So I'm going to jump to um, a 3D application for this. So ambient light is just a flat light. And if I just have a uh, scene in here, here's three spheres. With this ambient light in the scene, what it does is it lights up pretty much everything from one, from one universal direction. It's like evenly lit. Uh, typically, it's not good to have everything evenly lit because it looks flat. Uh, typically, when you light stuff, you would want to have um, some shading that would happen to it. So it looks like the spheres are actually round, okay? Um, this is important inside of Nuke because we do have some lighting inside there that we will use. Uh, and usually we'll use the ambient lights just as a way to kind of add a little bit of fill to things. Uh, the next area is going to deal with cameras. So I have, where's my image right there? So we have uh, this angle of view here, okay? And this is the angle that our lens and our... Um, our lens and our sensor and all these things are working together. So this angle right there... Uh, is what we're talking about. So when you uh, see that, obviously we need to know uh, what the angle of our camera is, what the angle of our lens is, so that when we put our, our video and photos and everything else together, that they'll match. Uh, if you have different camera angles, that will change how things are going to blend in. Think of like a wide eye or a wide, yeah, wide eye lens uh, versus something like a macro lens. Those two things are different. Uh, and how we would be able to see those uh, things, composite things together to make them look realistic. So we do have to know a little bit about cameras. The other thing that's important, it's not on the list, but sensor is important, so this is where the camera data is actually being written. And focal length, uh, I have to change this. Focal length uh, is on the thing, but I actually meant to write focus distance, and for some reason I wrote focal length. So focal length is the distance from the lens to the sensor, and focus distance is the distance from the lens to the object in focus. Okay, so we'll see that in a little bit too. I'll uh, remind you. Uh, compositing is basically all the stuff that we're doing. We're taking all of these 2D, 3D images, uh, whatever it is, and we're bringing them all together inside of Nuke. Uh, After Effects, you can do some stuff too. So any of this stuff that we have where I have... Um, Let's say a character, they have a green screen. I'm going to add a new image where this green screen is. That's all compositing. That's all uh, adjusting what that is, the end product is going to look like, uh, joining the stuff together. Even when we did um, any of the uh, 3D compositing things, we're, we're breaking it apart, putting it back together, and adjusting it. That's all compositing, all just putting stuff together. Um, plate shot. Jump to that. Um, this is a scene from District 9. <clears throat> and basically what a plate shot is, is uh, after the actors have acted inside the scene, um, usually they'll go back and they'll videotape the entire scene with the exact same camera moves um, inside it so they can get a nice clean plate. That way if they need to remove a character, um, they have all the background stuff right in the way. Now in this case, it's kind of neat because they actually rebuilt the scene um, inside of Nuke. <clears throat> And then they're able to erase characters. There was a character right here walking with his wheelbarrow. They're very easily able to erase those characters because they have those shots already in that. So a plate shot is basically just like a cleaned up version of the background without any characters or props, uh, you know, uh, inside the scene like this. And then in this case, in District 9, they actually built those um, shots uh, after the movie was, was out. Or not out, but you know, being worked on. Um... <clears throat> Post-production is just anything that happens after the fact. So after we, we're done with the actual production or the shooting, 
this is where post-production is, is coming in as well. So all of this extra stuff that they've added on top of it, um, this is all post-production stuff to that specific scene. Um, even audio is a post-production process. It's not something you typically work on while you're shooting. Okay. Uh, rough cut is <clears throat> when you have a movie. So this was uh, out a while ago. But this is a rough cut of Wolverine where they're not focused specifically on what the visual effects are. They're mainly focused on what does the camera shots look like. And then after they have this, they'll go back in there and go out, uh, add all the visual effects, change backgrounds, delete things, add things, whatever they need to do to get um, everything lined up. All right, and the next one is uh, depth of field and focus distance. That's what I was talking about before. So these are uh, more things dealing with cameras. So <clears throat> depth of field is basically the, the area where stuff is in focus. Um, we were looking inside Maya here, and I brought up a camera. I let Maya think, right? There we go, and I'm going to switch views. All right, so here is my uh, my camera. Now, if I'm looking at the camera and it's kind of pointed at an object here, uh, let's say that I wanted this object to be in focus. I would set a focus distance for this object to be in focus, <clears throat> uh, but the uh, depth of field might be this area here where it's kind of like this is the focused object, but this is where the field of focus is, where more objects are in focus and then gradually dropping out of focus, okay? And it's typically a phenomena, or not a phenomena, but a thing that you would set up um, when you're doing a video or a um, or shooting a photo, where you would get this um, blurry kind of effect on that. Okay. Oh, here's a picture. So here's the focus point, and then here is the depth of field. So we have a narrow depth of field in this case, um, and a wide depth of field. <coughs> Right, sorry, large depth of field here, narrow there. Okay, so only this is in focus, and then that area is in focus. Okay, uh, so it's important to know that because as we look at video, you have to understand um, where all of these things are coming from. Now, on the sheet, it says focal length, so you need to erase focal length and write focus distance. That's the correct uh, name of it. Um, and then shutter speed is another one. And shutter speed just refers to how fast the camera is clicking frames. Um, something at 60 frames per second versus 20 versus 10. Um, all of those things will come into play uh, as you start um, working on stuff and putting videos there. Uh, a breakdown is basically like you would show the before process and the after process. Or you might show, in this case, uh, several different iterations of things happening. Um, for a lot of times that we do uh, compositing, uh, if you just show the end product, like if you just showed this, you wouldn't know what went into it. So being able to show, hey, here's where we started and then this is what we ended up with um, is always good. And even showing the, the iterations between each of those phases is always a nice thing for uh, us to show to let people know what actually happened, what we did to it. All right. Uh, the next area is going to be talking about keying. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use this as an example here, <clears throat> and I'm going to go to my um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to go to my key light. Okay, uh, on here, this is what is removing a key. So basically, I want to remove this green from here, and so essentially, this is a green screen that I need to remove. Uh, now, it wouldn't matter if it's a green screen or a blue screen. It's the same idea. We're still removing that color. The idea with any of these, um, green screen, blue screens, um, sometimes are yellow, it's you want to pick a color that's not in your original video. So in this one, when I remove the green screen, you can also see that the plant in the background goes away, um, as well as like part of this. If I just put a uh, solid underneath it, I'll make it a crazy pinky color. <clears throat> you can really see where the pink and purple is kind of coming through those flowers. Um, so if we did this as a blue shot, uh, it might pick up some of the blue here, or if we did it as yellow, it might pick up some of the wood. 
Uh, typically, you're going to find green screens are the most popular, and especially that specific green, because that green is typically not in a whole lot of things. Even a brighter version of that would be uh, would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> so keying is basically just the, the, the terminology the terminology that we're using for just being able to cut things out and put things together. Uh, when we do cut something out using a green screen or blue screen, uh, we're basically creating a mat, and that mat is what we would use to composite things together. It's basically like we're building an alpha channel, and that's what that mat is. <clears throat> um, sometimes, whoops, sometimes we'll remove uh, some of that green screen. So let's go here, and I'm just going to adjust my settings a bit. Let's just delete that and remake it. Now, what happened to those settings? They worked before. I'm going to go here. I'm going to click that. <clears throat> uh, play with that a little bit. Go to my screen mat. Adjust this some. There we go. So it's it's not perfect right now, but uh, it's definitely better than it was a second ago. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so as we start removing those colors from here, sometimes we'll see that there's actually like a little bit of that green still on the character. Uh, and this is basically from um, uh, spillage, okay? The light from here is kind of like glowing around this, um, and we get this spill that would sometimes happen. And some of these softwares are pretty good. Um, Despill bias, so you can actually pick the color you want uh, to remove it. So in here I would go to, let's say, you know, green and you're blue you can see how it's replacing that color there um, depending on the kind of key or you're using you'll get different options as well now sometimes it helps <clears throat> in this case we might fight with this key or to like get this green to go away and not affect these uh, plants uh, so sometimes we'll make what's called a garbage mat and if i go in here and turn this on uh, that you'll see basically it gets rid of that area so i can just focus on this um, and this is basically just me just kind of like saying, okay, this is where my green screen is. I'm just going to animate or key out this area, and then I'll use that to add it back into the other spot. Uh, and so sometimes you'll use that garbage mat to do that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, we also have a um, difference key, uh, which I'll show in a second. Uh, where's the other one? Uh, rotoscoping. There we go. Uh, so rotoscoping is this. So sometimes, like, I may spend, you know, an hour uh, keying this out or however long it takes, and I still need a little bit of refinement. <clears throat> so that's where I can do rotoscoping to basically go frame by frame and animate this mask around the character's hand. Uh, now, it seems tedious, and it definitely is tedious, uh, but sometimes it's the only way to get the mask the way you want to look, to get exactly what you want. Um, even for color adjustments, his hand might be, you know, a little bit too bright. I want to darken it some. I could create a mask and use that, and that would still be considered uh, rotoscoping. I'm going to jump over to this shot here. <clears throat> so with this shot, um, I have this, which is a sky here, and I want to extract it. Now, there's no green screen or blue screen, uh, but what I can do is do what's called a luma key, where basically I'm using the brightness to extract the background out. So now if I were to put in a uh, solid color, I'll do pink again so we can see it. <clears throat> Drop it underneath, whoops, that's the wrong one. Uh, now you can see how we can see straight through there. Now more work has to be done. This is definitely disgusting, but uh, it definitely could help. Uh, so that is a uh, Luma key. And in, as long as you have brightness uh, values that are greater than everything else, then that would definitely work. Now, if someone in the back here had a pretty bright shirt on, like you can see a couple people do, I lose it. Some of those people are uh, being cut out, but that's where a garbage mat comes in, where we can make, you know, masks that would isolate it more to just this area back here. And maybe even incorporating uh, some rotoscoping in there as well. Jump back to this guy. <clears throat> uh, on the mask that I created here, uh, sometimes we'll have some feathering that we add. So here's his hand. Here is some feathering. Uh, that I could use on top of this. Let me turn off this purple so I can see what's happening. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong mask. Huh, huh. That's why it's not doing anything. This is the right mask I had. There we go. And then I can open up this and then open up that feathering. And you can see how I can feather 
uh, or expand <clears throat> that mask or play with the opacity. Okay. Um, so very easily we can do that. And sometimes it does take a lot of steps to get a nice clean mask uh, out of your shape. Uh, it's not always like click it and then you're good. Uh, usually there's a lot of other stuff that we may have to do. Uh, for some things like this glass here, I may want to create a mask around that, but let's say I want to use the opacity so I can still see kind of through it. Um, oops, put this back to add. <clears throat> so if I change that opacity on here, uh, you can see how I'm able to actually see through that if that's what I wanted to do. Um, in this case, it doesn't make sense for the guy's hand, but it could if he had something clear in front of that that we wanted um, to see through that area. Um, oh, and the last one is a difference key. <clears throat> A difference key works in a very similar fashion to a um, uh, Luma key in that it's looking at changes. <clears throat> so I'm going to go to my keyer here and I'm going to go to difference mat. And what this is going to do is it's going to extract the information from here based off of what is different in the other one. Okay, so I'm going to say, okay, whatever is different in um, that one. I think I can turn that off. Yes, okay. So right now it's completely uh, gone because everything is different. But then as I get further on here, maybe, maybe I need to adjust my settings. Uh, it's not playing nice. Uh, but essentially, I would use that to uh, er erase stuff. I'm not sure why my difference keys are working today, but uh, that's what it would do. <clears throat> Typically, you could use this if you had that. Um, uh, if you had this background here, you could say I'm on a difference key, so everything that's different from one plate to the next, I want to remove, and it could remove those things. All right, we talk about that. All right, crushed blacks. <clears throat> These are basically when your uh, image is just a little bit uh, too dark. Let me get rid of my masks. Okay, so right now we have good detail here in the shadow area, uh, but if I went to my levels and I, you know, adjusted my levels too much, sometimes I erase that data, and so now that's gone. So this is called crushed blacks when all your black values are crushed. Um, there's also crushed white values, which is the same thing, just the opposite, obviously. It would be uh, the whites are just too bright, and we've lost all of this data here, okay? So stuff to pay attention to while you're uh, compositing, while you're tweaking your stuff. Uh, the luminance of an image is the brightness. <clears throat> so wherever the bright spots are in an image, that's your luminance. Uh, we use it for just the brightness of each pixel. Obviously, for this, we need to be aware that, hey, the luminance was a great way to pull a key out of the back of this uh, for that. We also have hue, which is just the general color. So if I went to my color correction here and I went to hue, saturation, and value, so if I adjust the hue on this, I can shift what the hue of that image would look like. Uh, I also have saturation, and I also have the lightness of it. This is just one tool that's inside of After Effects, where there's lots of tools that we can use. Uh, <clears throat> the next area here, uh, and really a lot of these kind of intermix, uh, but this color grading part, this is where you really can add uh, with the final look to your images. So it's not always just about, like, I've, I've done the compositing and I'm done, uh, but what does the end product look like? Uh, this uh, After Effects actually has a pretty cool tool uh, at the college called... Um, magic bullet and it has this thing called looks and basically if I go into this edit thing I can control what the uh, look of it will be what the end of look will be and if I have something where I'm like oh cool I want to you know make this a little bit grungier you know I can do this kind of, of appearance to it now that might be for a specific shot or whatever you know but uh, that's the idea is that never consider your work like completely done just because you've done the um, compositing on it Always look for ways that you can uh, enhance the work to make it look better. Okay, and all these are just doing the same thing. Uh, there's different effects here, different uh, adjustments, vignettes, cameras, blurs, that kind of thing uh, on top of it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, white balance refers to the um, coloring that comes in. So if we look at, I thought I had an image for that one too, I don't. 
If we look at an image here, <clears throat> you'll see there's basically two different colorings that's happening. Uh, inside the camera, uh, we're specifying the lighting that's coming in. Like, where is the actual like white and black of the, the real world and matching those things up. Uh, this will become more important as we get more into compositing of how to do these things. Uh, but usually as you look at the different colors, you look at different things that you're videotaping or uh, taking photos of, um, you want to make sure that you're portraying the best uh, representation of that. Here's another good one. So you can see here's the different color settings, and then here's the different color settings that you would actually end up with. So if we're trying to get this kind of look and we shot with these kind of settings, uh, we may want to, or we do want to make sure our videos and other things that we add to it match all of that stuff. Okay. So that white balance is what is typically referred to as the, um, like, what does a pure white look like? <clears throat> and then the next couple we have is, um, let me delete looks from here. I'm going to go to color correction. There we go. And one is exposure, <clears throat> uh, and that one has this uh, contract or gamma in here. And gamma refers to how the computer is converting our image into something that's readable. Um, typically, if I set this to that, that's typically what the uh, computer sees when it does its calculations, and then it converts it, and then this is what we actually get. Okay. Um, so gamma correction is something that we would typically play with uh, for adjusting our colors. Uh, it's important to know just some of these basic terms like gamma. Um, another one is contrast. <clears throat> so if I go into um, where was it? There it is. Brightness and contrast. Um, here's contrast. So just the amount of black and white that you have there. So cranking this uh, contrast up. You can see that we're darkening the darks and kind of lightening the lights. And so we're adding more contrast to the scene. And you can see there's a huge difference in uh, just this one slider. You know, it's a subtle huge difference, but it's still a huge difference. Um, and then we have color space. And color space is referring to um, whenever you're working with an image, what are you trying to emulate? Because this is what it looks like on my screen. If I took this to someone else's screen, what is it going to look like? If I took it on a Mac, what is it going to look like? When I put on a projector and shine it on a screen, what is it going to look like? So color space is going to refer to that. Um, different uh, vendors will have different uh, profiles that you could use. Um, so that's obviously something to pay attention to in the bigger picture world. Uh, in our class, we mainly just stick with RGB for our stuff. Uh, unless we're going to print it, then we would do CMYK. Uh, lossless and lossy we already talked about. That's the compression, how we lose quality. <clears throat> uh, uh, the next one is matte painting. And matte painting is, is a painting of like a background or painting of a scene. Uh, typically inside of images you'll see, uh, or movies, you'll see like a huge uh, elaborate background or foreground or whatever it is. Um, and those are a lot of times just like still images or com composites of images and movies together. Um, it's not like an actual shot uh, flattened out, you know, just like a regular, like we shot this and that's what it looks like. Usually they've added enhancements to it. So this scene here, uh, this is from the Noman Workshop, is like painted uh, inside here. And so they could use this in the background or even in the foreground. They could animate some of these things, animating this um, smoke here, uh, to use that as a scene for the, um, for the movie or whatever it is they're shooting. Uh, the next one is progressive. <clears throat> and to understand progressive, we have to understand interlaced. So interlaced is basically when you look at an image on a screen, you would see every other line is one frame, and then the other lines are the opposite, or the next frame. Okay, so you get this like lined uh, image. Progressive is one solid image every single time. So some cameras will record in this, this interlaced fashion, and some will be nice and clean, all solid frames. Uh, these are good for slow motion. These are good for fast motion because if we had an interlaced, uh, interlaced fast motion, um, the difference between one frame and another uh, would look very odd because we would actually see like the person split. <clears throat> so here's a car moving very fast. You can see the lines of the car. Uh, or here's a car driving. You can see the lines of that. Uh, where if it's progressive, you don't see that information. Okay. 
Uh, the next couple are going to deal with uh, time. So uh, let's jump to Nuke. <clears throat> so we have uh, time code. Now there's not a time code inside of Nuke. Like it's just like frames. That's all we have here. Uh, in After Effects, though, we do have a time code. So this is the current time that I'm at. Uh, but if I go to this piece of footage and I double click it, here's the time code for that. So here's all of the stuff. So this was actually shot at uh, 1301 is when it starts and then 2724 is where it ends. Uh, and so this is important because if this was a shot for a big movie, I need to keep track of where all these frames are. If I were to edit this video, take this clip, bring it into After Effects, export it, bring it to Nuke, do what I need to, then it has to go back into After Effects or back into Premiere, wherever they send it after that, uh, and then put all together. And so understanding that time code of where things fall in place is obviously important. <clears throat> uh, we will be dealing with frames, like I said. So Nuke is just frames. So here's frames. Um, if we hit S here, we can see um, the frame range, 1 to 200 in this case, and 24 frames a second. Um, so we, that's what we're mainly concerned with when we talk about that frame rate. <clears throat> um, each one of these frames is just a, an individual picture. If it was interlaced, then obviously we would have two pictures kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, there's another uh, term that we're going to use kind of interchangeably. So we have frames per second, which is this. Um, how many frames are there in one second? And then we have frame rate. And they're used interchangeably, but they're separate on here, okay? Uh, typically, a standard film rate is 24, <clears throat> NTSC is 29.97, and PAL is 25. Again, these are important so that as you shoot footage, um, you need to know what to shoot your footage at. Uh, frame is at. Frame rate is the rate at which the videos are played, okay? So we might have a 30 frame per second, <clears throat> 24 frame per, sec per second video, uh, but the frame rate that it's playing back uh, may play back a little bit slower or faster or whatever. Um, so don't get these two confused. When we refer to frame rate, we're talking about what the actual, like, frames being played back. Where we're talking about frames per second, we're talking about the actual, like, footage of what it's going to be. Um, scoot that back. And then keyframes are just as we're animating things. <laughs> if I'm in After Effects uh, and I want to take this guy here, go here, and I'm just moving this down, okay? I've just set a keyframe. I've set two keyframes, one at the start and one at the end. Uh, anything that we uh, bring into Nuke can be animated, any controls, effects, whatever. Um, even in After Effects, any of those things can be animated. It's simply a matter of just right-clicking on the property and then setting keyframes and then adjusting those keyframes uh, in our timeline, which is right here. Um, Nuke just has this one timeline for the entire thing. Uh, if we're in After Effects, we have one timeline, but each one of these things we can kind of offset and move around. So something to be aware of is just they do work different. These are layer-based. This is uh, node-based. <clears throat> the next one is... Uh, Match moving and match moving, stabilizing, tracking. They're all talking about different aspects of the same thing. Uh, so I'm going to go here. This is um, that piece of footage. Now I'm going to pretend that I wanted to actually put uh, something up here. So what I did was I tracked parts of this. Okay. And I take this uh, word tracking and I've actually matched it up to the movement of this. So as that camera moves, you can see that that's moving with it as well. Um, if it wasn't tracked, um, then it would just stay in place. So if I just get rid of those tracking points, you'll see that it doesn't move at all. It just stays right in place. Now the other uh, part of tracking, this is called tracking to get it, you know, to track the points to figure out how this is moving. Match moving is where we're matching the movement of one item to another. <clears throat> and then the other part of this is stabilizing. Um, one, yes. So inside After Effects, you can do Stabilize, <clears throat> and then I just hit Apply. Uh, and then what it's going to do is it's going to stabilize the movement. So in this case, it's going to be a pretty subtle thing, uh, but it's trying to make sure that there's not a whole lot of movement happening on that. Um, usually you'll get this if you have like a jittery camera. This will help smooth out the jittery camera so it's not like going crazy. Um, so usually we'll use it for that. And sometimes you'll actually stabilize uh, add something and then unstabilize it to get it back to being jittery again. Uh, time lapse <clears throat> is this. This is a video I shot, which is time lapse, which is 
uh, one picture every, I think, 10 seconds. And it's a good way to see, you know, changes over time versus, you know, me taking a video this long and then speeding it up. Uh, that would take forever and a lot of disk space. Uh, timeline we talked about, that's down here. Uh, motion artifacts. <clears throat> um, this is a motion artifact. As this was videotaped, this camera, uh, because of how the, the video was moving, um, actually wasn't recording fast enough. So as the camera shutter was opening uh, and then closing, we actually get like the top of this is further back than the bottom of it. Okay, and it's just like one of the things that happen sometimes with cameras and just not being able to record fast enough uh, as they're moving. <clears throat> uh, let's go here. Uh, motion blur is the blurriness that we get when stuff moves. So you can see like on his hand here, as he's moving his hand from one spot to the other, we're actually getting a bit of blurriness right there. They're pretty clear, but then they start to blur out as he's moving his hand. So that's motion blur. And if we were to track something to his hand, uh, that item also needs to be motion blurred so that it matches his movement. Okay. <clears throat> um, pixelation is basically, let's say we just took this and scaled it up way too high. Okay, like even higher. Uh, if we make something too big, it's gonna look very grainy. Uh, and sometimes this can happen if you grab a, an image or you make an image uh, that's way too small uh, and you try to scale it up to fit in a bigger space or it gets you know closer to the camera, you get this pixelation um, that happens. Uh, and then anti-aliasing. In this image, you can see there's a nice blend between these background pixels. His finger there, there's a nice blending that happens between those. Um, so this is, there's, there's no... Um, it's anti-aliased, so there's no like edges like stair-stepping where you can see this is exactly where this ends and this is exactly where uh, that stops. Uh, if I scoot this down, oops, come on. There we go, just delete my mask. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, if I use that mask that's on there and I say add, you can see there's a definite softness to it because I added a little bit of feather, but let's say I take that feathering off. Don't jump. Okay. Now as we get closer to this, you can see there's still a tiny bit, oh, I have a tiny bit there, there we go. There's still a tiny bit of anti-aliasing um, happening here or aliasing happening here where we can see the edge of this and then how it's blending into that. Uh, so anti-aliasing kind of fights that. Usually we'll see it more in um, elements as we're bringing them together. Um, let's go here. Or if we had something that's from 3D. As I look at the edge of this, <clears throat> I can pretty much see like where the stair stepping is happening. It may be hard to see in the video. Uh, but I can see where that edge is happening. And so anti-aliasing would get rid of that edge. Uh, so it's just another way for us to pay attention, or another thing for us to pay attention to as we're blending images together. So here's maybe a better image of it. Here's alias, you can see the edging, the stair stepping. Here's anti-alias, nice and smooth, okay? So if we took this and put it on our, on our video, it would look horrible. But doing this, it blends in with the background a bit nicer than it, it would otherwise. Okay. So that's uh, one more, sorry. One more. Uh, the last word. The last word of the day. Let's just delete that mask. Uh, is noise. Now, in uh, typically every video, you're going to have some kind of noise happening inside there. Uh, I'm going to delete these. I don't need these anymore. I'm just going to add a uh, levels to this. I'm going to pull these values up a bit just so we can see the noise in this. So his shirt is not crystal clear. You can actually see some patterns of, of noise that are happening. And as the uh, camera plays, uh, that noise is also kind of shuffling around too. So as we were to add something to this scene, uh, we actually need to make sure that that noise matches um, inside of him and inside of our uh, other scene. Sometimes inside of Nuke we'll actually remove noise. Uh, they have some denoise functions like this. 
<clears throat> and then uh, they have other ones that are noise. So we would denoise, then we would add noise. Uh, and that's all part of that uh, whole getting things to look like they're actually part of the video. So we have to be able to analyze what does the video look like, what are the uh, motion blur, what's the camera, what's the lenses, focus points, all that stuff. And then getting um, all of these things wrapped up so that they move together and seem like they're all seamlessly put together. All right, so now that is our last word. So uh, I know it's a lot uh, to digest, but just going through those will help you definitely understand um, how we do what we do inside of compositing, or just at least the starting points of it.